Okay, this is a quick review of the 2018-19 midterm. We're going to start with <clears throat> we're going to start to, with the poem, The Raven. And anytime you see uh, the use of consonants in a row, for instance, like Lionel licking lollipops is an example of alliteration. And at the end of the poem, basically the author thinks that the raven has come from hell. Um, it uses different words like respite as vocabulary which is like you would find that in a recess. Placid is a peaceful look. Uh, a tempest would be kind of like thunder or storm that you would be in. Now if you have uh, the use of A's, or I shouldn't say A's, but vowels, such as Avery ate Amy's lame mate, that's a sonnet, not alliteration. A sonnet. So alliteration is consonants, a sonnet is vowels. At the beginning of the poem, the speaker is basically trying to uh, immerse himself in books in an effort to basically forget Lenore, and he ends up nodding off and, and falls asleep while reading. The raven, which we see in this story, basically gives him continual reminders of his lost love, Lenore. At the end of the poem, the one thing that he is feeling least is relieved. He's depressed, he's obsessed, he's confused. He is in a, a bad state of affair. Uh, in the poem, the raven is most probably intended to represent the finality of death in regards to Poe's wife. In general, the words that are most often repeated throughout the poem is nevermore. The speaker of the poem is not watching his wife die. She has died. However, in real life, Edgar Allan Poe was watching his wife die when he wrote the poem. And the poem takes place at midnight in December. And Edgar's foster mother's name was Frances. Edgar was thrown out of college because he had an issue with drinking and gambling. The name of Poe's wife was Virginia. And the story Edgar wrote that won him $100 was The Gold Bug. Poe's funeral was not heavily attended by people. In fact, there was very few people who showed up at all. And there was a mystery man who left three roses and a bottle of cognac at Poe's grave for the longest time, who was dubbed as the Poe Toaster. Edgar Allan Poe's last resting place resides in Baltimore, Maryland. And the type of writer Poe was, he was a psychological writer, and he was also the father of the detective novel. In Of Mice and Men, moving to that, Lenny did not blame Curly's wife for the death of the puppy, he blamed himself, and he was worried that he would not get to tend the rabbits after it happened. George tells Lenny about the farm before shooting him. George then turns around and tells Lenny that he's to keep quiet when they meet the boss so they can get the job. Candy asks Carlson to shoot his dog. Uh, basically, Carlson wants to shoot the dog. Candy doesn't want his dog shot, but unfortunately, Carlson convinces him along with Slim to shoot the dog. Slim was the only one in the novel that understood George's final actions in killing Lenny but being upset about it. Lenny and George were traveling companions but they were never related and someday they planned to buy a ranch if they saved up enough money and live off the fat of the land. The only two people that were interested in George's plans who heard about it is Candy and Crooks. However, Crooks, after being threatened by Curly's wife, doesn't want to be a part of it anymore. <clears throat> George tells Lenny to run and hide in the brush if there's any trouble, and George kills Lenny with Carlson's gun that he stole. The men joke about Curly because he wears a Vaseline filled glove to keep his hands soft and Candy is afraid that he will be fired soon because of his injury and the fact that he's getting old. Uh, Curly does not like Lenny because he's a big guy. He doesn't like big guys. He's got short man syndrome, really. And while Lenny and Curly are in the, uh, Curly's wife are in the barn, the men are tossing horseshoes outside. Uh, Curly's wife is wanting to know from Lenny, uh, basically, how Curly hurt his hand. At the beginning of the story, George and Lenny, they leave weed because they scare a girl by Lenny touching her dress. Wit, who is one of the ranch hands' favorite cat house, is Clara's place. 
Then he dreams about what is in the last chapter of the thing, a giant uh, mouse, not a rabbit. But, or I'm sorry, he, he, he dreams about a giant rabbit talking to him. And he also has uh, a conversation with Aunt Clara, who has died as well. And to go back on Wit's favorite cat house, it wasn't Clara's place. That was Lenny's aunt. It was Susie's place. Looking at Slim's job on the ranch, his job was to, um, he drove mules. A motif that basically is a reoccurring subject or theme or idea, which in the story the motif was to live off the fat of the land and that most people are lonely. What is an illusion? That's a figure of speech that makes reference to a story, place, or event. Moving on to the cru uh, crucible, uh, Thomas Putnam would be considered vindictive and spiteful. Reverend Paris is reluctant or hesitant to tell anyone that Betty may be bewitched because he's afraid of his reputation being destroyed. And most of the villagers view Rebecca Nurse as a kind and respectable woman, while Reverend Paris is mostly concerned again with his reputation and himself. Abigail went into the forest because she wanted to uh, get rid of Goody Proctor and cast a charm from Tichuba to get rid of her. We can infer then or assume that the citizens of Salem thought dancing was evil and sinful by their reaction to it. Tichuba most likely confessed to meeting with the devil only because, well, she didn't want to be killed. She wanted to save her life. John Proctor is a person who technically rebels against authority and he speaks his mind freely in the community, which is something that most people don't like. Rebecca advises Paris to send Reverend Hale away because essentially she fears that his presence would only cause more hysteria and issues in Salem. Elizabeth urges John to go to Salem though and basically um, tell that Abigail's story is a lie and a hoax. When they say that people part like the Red Seas for Abigail, it's like Moses parting the Red Sea. They fear her power to accuse them, so they get away from her. By the end of Act 2, Reverend Hale has begun to worry that perhaps innocent people are being accused of stuff that they haven't done. Sarah Good is accused of witchcraft, but because the reason why is because she cannot recite the Ten Commandments. And the, at first, Mary Warren enjoys, enjoys her role in court because she likes the power and status she now has in the village, which she's never possessed before. Why does Mary say she cannot tell the truth in court? She's afraid Abigail will turn on her and kill her. She'll be punished. Goody Osborne is supposed to hang, but Sarah Good won't hang because she confesses, and because she confesses she's a witch, she's spared. In Act 3, the details of the setting, it creates a mood that is gloomy and forbidding in the courtroom. When Abigail says to Danforth, quote, think you may be so high and mighty that the power of hell may not turn your wits, beware of it, she is threatening Danforth and saying, just because you're a judge doesn't mean that you are above the devil. So what we can we conclude about Reverend Paris then in Act 3? He's a cowardly person and he's wretched because he knows the truth when it's said out loud. Elizabeth Proctor doesn't tell Danforth Abigail is a harlot because she wants to protect John's reputation. Moving on to the minister's black veil, a parable. The word parable that tells you about the story is it teaches a message. What we can infer then about the beliefs of the minister's congregation is that they fear God, just like all Puritans do. Mr. Hooper's veil and the relationship between people are never completely clear. And what we can infer about Elizabeth when she asks him to remove the veil is she's angry with him for wearing the veil. Um, how does the minister's black veil con convey the Puritan attitude toward human nature? It's pessimistic. It's full of pessimism. And who takes care of Mr. Hooper during the final admission during the black veil is basically Elizabeth, who is left. A moral lesson of this story might be, basically, that guilty secrets separate us from one another. The parishioners have such an intense response to seeing the minister's veil because they're frightened by it. The passage in the minister's black veil that basically says about the belief of the congregation that while he prayed the veil lay heavily on his uplifted countenance basically most 
most people protect their personal privacy by wearing a public mask is what it's trying to get at. For members of the church who saw Mr. Hooper's veil and an unsought pathos came hand in hand with awe, how did they feel about him? Well, they kind of thought he was, they thought the veil was simply awful and they couldn't stand it being on him. Over what the group does, the veiled minister seemed to have the most power. He has the most power over people who are in agony from sinning. Those people sought him out. Uh, they weren't afraid of him. The statement that expresses the central theme of the story basically is that people who sin, um, or people who have faith can overcome any hardship. The message about human nature is most strongly conveyed by Elizabeth's nursing of Mr. Hooper on his deathbed, and that is that, that love for someone endures despite what that person does. The black veil most likely symbolizes secret sin. All right, moving on to trashed. Where did they? Where did the first dump actually occur in history? Well, it happened in Knossos, Crete, in 3000 BC. In the early stages of life, man's general way to get trash was basically they just tossed it out the window into the streets. But in the 1400s in Paris, trash got so bad they decided to, something had to be done. Um, well, it was because the trash had become unbearable to the point where it was high against the city walls and it compromised their defenses. And who established the first efficient method of trash collection? That would be the English. And in the 1800s, the group that collected all the stuff in London and sorted it out in the outskirts, they were known as dustmen. Not garbage men, but dustmen. In 72, the American, Americans established the first street sanitation force in the city of Philadelphia under Ben Franklin. And the Philadelphia slaves, what they did with the trash after they collected it, basically they just dumped it in the river. In the pre-Civil War era, the method that was used to get rid of trash was they let hogs eat it. But by the 1900s, the hogs had overran everything, so a new method was established by the government to get rid of, of garbage, and they basically burned it in incinerators. But after World War II, the universal way of getting rid of unregulated trash was the what we do now today, which is landfills. Unfortunately, the landfills are now getting to the point where they're so full, we won't be able to sustain that either. Um, Americans produce about 300 million tons of garbage a year, which is huge. And the average amount of diapers a child will go through in a lifetime is 8,000 diapers before they're potty trained. Diapers cannot be composted, although new new changes are being made now to try and make diapers that can be. Um, the average person makes 150 pounds of trash a month as well as 1,847 pounds of trash a year. So far the most effective program of recycling our communities have right now is called single streamed recycling. However, recycling itself isn't very profitable to people. The garbage trucks have been on the streets for over a hundred years now, and in our dumps, the toxic liquid that's squeezed from buried trash is called leachate. And the gallons of toxic liquid that is spilled into the ground is 3,000 gallons a year is dumped into the grounds from this stuff. The gas created from the garbage is called methane, and the nation's largest landfill that exists today is in Las Vegas, Las Vegas, Nevada. When the garbage men uh, basically use the chipper to cut up waste and trees, when things like a man's appendage or body gets caught in the chipper, it's known as morsalization. Being a garbage man is extremely dangerous, and it is the top ten most dangerous jobs, and it ranks sixth overall. Old unregulated landfills have no regulations right now, and many still are in operation and they are still leaking leachate into the ground as we speak. It takes over a thousand years for styrofoam to decompose. Uh, looking over to one of the most dangerous substances that's released into the ground right now from batteries and electronics and fluorescent lights, it's mercury. It's very very bad stuff. And when it what it is called when the manufacturers do not want goods to last long, so they build them to last only a certain amount of time, is called built-in obsolence. So they build them not to last. 
The poor generates more trash on the classification of poor upper and middle, uh, which is not true at all. Actually, the more people make, the more they throw away. And that's it for your questions. I wish you the best of luck on your assessment.